Hey everybody on YouTube, Murray Carter from Carter Cutlery here. You know, we've been uh, putting out a lot of videos recently for your education and your entertainment. And then recently we asked you guys, you know, do you have any questions for us? We've had a real big influx of questions, but uh, we were able to kind of divide them into two major categories. We've got a lot of questions on sharpening stones and sharpening technique and theory. And then we have a lot of questions on blade styles, blade steels, blade construction. So. We're going to kind of divide those into two and today I'm going to deal with the stones sharpening, sharpening theory and in a future video I'll answer some questions about uh, metallurgy, blades and uh, blade style construction. So I'm going to read off the questions and I'm going to flurry through the answers here real quick. Question one, I've got this uh, plan of buying an unsharpened Japanese blue super steel blade and grinding it or sharpening it by hand on water stones. Uh, which will probably take ages, but I still want to give it a try. Any tips? Yes, if that's what you want to do, first thing you got to do with sharpening is always make sure the blade is straight first, especially if you're going to do a, a, a Japanese chisel ground knife, right? Uh, they have a tendency, the, uh, the steel side of the blade has a tendency over time to continue expanding as it goes through its isothermal transformation process, which usually ends up pushing the blade against the mild steel. And then you start grinding away the mild steel and uh, the problem becomes even more complex because the hardened steel kind of starts to win out over the, the uh, mild steel, which is kind of trying to retain it in place. So very tricky. Uh, I deal with that in uh, my video of uh, slicing knives, specifically how to sharpen the Japanese kataha knives. Uh, but that is not for a beginner. Or tackle the project and, you'll, and hopefully you'll, you'll transition from beginner to expert real quick. Uh, but you want to make sure the blade's straight and then of course you want to start off with the most abrasive stone that you can get. One of the other guys in these questions asked me, hey you guys are now offering 200 grit and 400 grit stones in the nano hone lineup. Why is that when you used to start with an 800? Well because the lower grit stones are going to remove metal more quickly when you've got a big project like that. Okay, another question. Uh, I was curious if you used the tuna, so that was it, 200 and 400 grit stones. Yes. We do use them. That's the beautiful thing about the Nanohone system is, especially with the backing plates that you can purchase separately, is you could have literally 20 different grit stones in your lineup at home, always being able to select an appropriate stone for the task at hand. You've got a knife that's more or less really sharp that you just want to put that final razor sharp edge on for shaving your face or doing something artistic in the kitchen, then you can go straight to like a 6,000 grit stone if it's already got an edge more or less established. When we sell knives here, the last thing we do is we check them for straightness and for overall quality and we put the final edge on. Uh, usually we just go straight to the 6,000 grit stone here because we already spent time earlier in the knife making process with the uh, lower grit stones establishing the edge geometry and all we need is the 6,000 grit stone to put the final edge on it. So. Uh, there's nothing, there's no substitute for experience, so get as many stones as you can, sharp as many blades as you can, and experiment. Well, I'm going to start this sharpening project with this stone, I'm going to, sh and so on and so forth, and you'll learn very quickly. Okay, when you talk about thinning a blade to improve the secondary edge, will this permanently scratch blades that are made of Damascus steel? Someone also said, what if you've got a honyaki blade and it's got a beautiful like hamon on it, like imagine a Japanese samurai sword or some of the cooking knives coming out of Japan and elsewhere these days. Uh, yeah, the only, way, the only way to get the secondary edge on a blade thin is to lay it down on an abrasive and grind it. And grinding leaves scratches. And uh, the scratches don't look like the original finish. Uh, the good news is, is, and I cover it in our Blade Sharpening Fundamentals, which is now up online for free for you guys all to uh, watch, enjoy, study, and learn from. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, if you can scratch a blade, you can also polish it. Will it look the same as when it was finished? Probably not. In my eyes, I think it looks better because it looks like you're, you're, you are imparting your own tender, loving care and attention and knowledge to that blade. Uh, and like I say, it's like the odometer on a classic motorcycle. The more miles on a classic motorcycle, the more respect you'll get. The more scratches there are on your blade, the more respect you'll get from people who look and see that. Uh, if in the case of a Damascus blade, yeah, you scratch it up by thinning it. Then you polish it up with a finer stone. Then what you can do is you can actually re-etch the blade 
We do it in ferric chloride as well as some other uh, caustic uh, acids. I guess, I don't know if you call it caustic or acidic acids. And uh, uh, you, can, you can reestablish the etch on a, on a blade. But here's the thing. You can almost never perfectly reproduce uh, a finish on a blade the way the factory or the way the other knife maker did it. Uh, because they have their own system, their own style, and, and, and uh, idiosyncrasies in their shop, like their, their grinder and their buffers and everything else is, is very particular to their shop and the type of abrasives they're using and the sequence that they use. So it is almost impossible to perfectly reproduce someone else's finish. But hopefully you're buying knives from somebody that you can send them back to to get refinished if that's a concern of yours. But yeah, you, you scratch them up, it's unavoidable. You know, if you want sharp knives that have thin secondary edge geometry, you got to be willing to, to grind them. In your recent push cutting toilet paper video, I noticed when sharpening the knife, you made some strokes that were sort of semi strop strokes in that they went back and forth parallel to the blade edge before continuing in long, one long strop motion. This was done before finally stropping at the end. How come you do this? Uh, listen, I've hand sharpened 125, 130,000 knives so far in 32 years. And that video in particular, uh, I was doing it uh, without any time lapse, it was real time. I totally took the edge off the blade and then I was trying to get it razor sharp again in the fastest amount of time. So I didn't even think about it. I just let my hands do it. I just went on autopilot. And uh, you know, there's ways we teach beginners to sharpen that are very methodical and very uh, uh, logical. Uh, but there's a point at which the beginner will advance to be an intermediate sharpener and then in a master sharpener. And some strokes on the blade on the stones just intuitively make sense. Sometimes you're trying to, you know, capture the foil or the burr between the stone and the edge. Sometimes you're you're doing trailing edge, but and then every blade shape, style and metallurgy will tell your hand something a little different and you'll learn to do it subconsciously. It's subconscious competence. So why I do that can't answer. But I think in the span of like three and a half minutes or something, we got a blade that was perfectly dull to razor sharp. Now, <laughs> commenting on that video, because some of you guys are, take these videos really, really seriously. And I'm glad for that, but that video wasn't one to be taken seriously. Like, I wasn't taking it seriously. For me, the whole idea of push cutting toilet paper, whether you can slice cut it or push cut or whatever, for, for me, it, it's, it's, I find it amusing. I kind of find it funny. It's not something I take seriously. Cutting vegetables, meats, uh, you know, serving my customers, making sure that they're happy with their cutlery. Like, that's what I take seriously. And yes, it was not a push cut. That, uh, uh, as soon as I kind of pushed it, I noticed that it wasn't going to cut. So the only way I could do anything was, was slice a little bit. So it was a slice cut. It wasn't a push cut. But, but guys, don't take that seriously. It wasn't a big deal for us, except that we're happy to have your viewership. And uh, push cutting toilet paper is nothing I'm ever going to try to master. That's why in the video I said, uh, it was mediocre results because uh, it was a mediocre test. Good friend Kevin in Thailand says, uh, have you found a difference in your edges changing from the old method of sharpening to the new nanohone? I think probably the same level of sharpness, but perhaps faster at getting the job done. Kevin, you're absolutely right. You know, uh, how sharp we can get a knife really has to do with that subconscious competence I was talking about earlier, like our hands just knowing the stone, knowing the blade, knowing what we're trying to cut taking all of those factors into consideration, we just start grinding. And, uh, you know, if you can competently grind, then, you know, so long as your abrasives are half decent, you know, it's still, it's more technique than it is the abrasives. I think at one time I was bold and said something like, sharpening is 90% technique and only 10% tools. I still stand by that statement. So uh, the beautiful thing about Nanohone is, is it's got a wider variety of abrasives to choose from. If you already have 20 stones at home and you like your system, excellent. No need to upgrade, no need to change to what I use. Uh, you, to each their own, but yeah, we pretty much get the same results. I do find, uh, I do find the uh, I, one thing that I really like about Nanohone is the is the sharpening stage that lifts the stones up higher and always gives my knuckles nice clearance. I like that. Okay, someone says, I'm planning to restore an old meat cleaver. Is there anything different I should do when starting to sharpen compared to sharpening a smaller blade? 
do the same principles apply in putting an edge on a heavy meat cleaver? Look, a heavy meat cleaver, unless you are a glutton for punishment, I had one come in the other day. It was like this huge two-handed jobby, uh, really thick uh, and really rusty. And you know, I just used a power tool. Meat cleavers, you know, by their, by their nature, you're cleaving, you're chopping, and, and you don't want very thin edge geometry. So there's a lot of mass down there to, to, uh, to keep the edge from folding or failing under the impact of itself. So uh, first of all, because there's more metal there, you can use electric grinders or angle grinders or whatever you want with little risk of heat buildup. Of course, you have to be careful, and we cover that in our, ever, our other video. Our advanced blade sharpening DVD, I talk about uh, using uh, electric equipment, and that's the next one we're going to uh, list, uh, we're going to upload on YouTube for free, by the way, so uh, you can uh, look forward to that. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is that a cleaver doesn't have to be pretty, and it, it doesn't even have to be like hair popping, hair razor sharp, because you're cutting by centrifugal force, you're cutting by, by, by momentum. Uh, so, you know, I would just use whatever I had in the shop that took the least amount of time, you know, grinding pretty hard, but being careful that I didn't uh, heat the blade up to uh, adversely affect the temper. Definitely wouldn't do that by hand on stones. If it was me, unless, unless that's what you wanna do. Okay, I'm uh, wondering what you think about soaking the higher grit, the polishing stones. I heard if you soak uh, polishing stones, then they can crack sometimes. Have you experienced anything like this? And uh, because I saw you soaking your stones in the blade sharpening fundamentals video, which is online for free now. Uh, and one more question, uh, when are you gonna publish your other DVDs? I'd like to watch them all. Well, just, we're gonna publish them uh, one after the other. So uh, stay tuned. So, uh, you have to know your stones, and there are some stones that uh, do not like to be soaked for a long time in water, uh, especially if you live in a colder climate because sometimes that water can freeze and then inadvertently crack your, crack your stones. So uh, you just have to know your stones. I one time had a stone from Japan. It was a natural stone. I left it in water for a long time, and when I went to use it, the surface of the stone kind of like turned to mud. So. Uh, as far as I know, with the king stones, you can soak them indefinitely. With the nano stones, uh, you, can, you can soak them. But the beautiful thing about the nano stones are they are splash and go, which means you can keep them dry until the very instant you want to use them. You don't need to soak them in order to be able to use them like the old king 1000 grit stone that I used to use and like some other stones as well. So little uh, trial and error there is, uh, is the answer. Okay, how do you keep a wet stone flat? Well, uh, for years and years and years, I said that a really inexpensive way to keep a whetstone flat, well, the best way to keep a whetstone flat is every time you use it, you, you, you look at your stone, you see where your high spots are and your low spots are, you use some natural light, and then you, uh, you grind. Of course, this isn't a stone, it's a box, I know, but I'm giving you an illustration here. Uh, you use the high spots of the stone. So, so as you grinding the blade, you're also grinding and, and, and maintaining your stone. Ideally, that's the way you do it. If, it. if you get a stone at a garage sale or inherit one or one of the stones you have at home has just, it's really scooped out and hollowed out, what I used to teach is, is you can go outside, find yourself a piece of sidewalk where the neighbors aren't gonna be angry at you and a bucket of water and you can do figure eights on the sidewalk and keep looking at your stone and basically grind your stone down on the sidewalk or use a cinder block or whatever. And it depends how hard your stone is, whether if that's going to work or not. Uh, and that often leaves some pretty deep scratches in your stone. But you can do it, and it usually doesn't cost anything except for your time. And you learn a little something doing it. Uh, a better way, a much more pleasant way to do it, that's more precise, more expedient, faster, more repeatable, is to use the diamond lapping plates that we now sell that is a product of NanoHone. We're, we've, we're using the world's best diamonds and uh, best technology. And every time I step up to the stone, I take three seconds and I go one, two, three with my diamond lapping plate. I put the diamond lapping plate aside. And every time, because I do that, the stones are always flat and always a pleasure to use. And what's more, I can take those diamond lapping plates and I can chamfer the corners around the size of the stone, which are the places that are more, most apt to chip and uh, to make the stone look ugly. It doesn't really negatively affect the performance if it chips, but uh, it's nicer when that doesn't happen. Okay, uh, which of the king stones does Murray use when he's not using the new NanoHone system? 
And has he tried the newer King Stones, like the Hyper, like the King Hyper and King Neo brand stones? And if so, what does he think of them? Uh, we, because there's 10 of us in this shop, and we've got seven or eight people who are constantly uh, sharpening knives, everyone has their own preference. So we have 20 different stones around our shop uh, divided between two sharpening stations. And I know some of the bladesmiths here still like to use the King 1000 grit stone and follow up with a, uh, a 6000 grit stone. Uh, for myself, I don't use the King stones anymore. I use Nanahone stones. And uh, there's a couple of other stones that I've had over the years that I've incorporated into that system as well. Again, 90% technique, only 10% tool, guys. Don't be overly fixated on, you know, is it a Nanahone? Is it a Shapton? Is it a Kingstone? Is it Bester? Is it uh, Naniwa? Like, get yourself some good stones and, and, and actually then get yourself that 90% component, which is experience and knowledge, okay? That's way more important. Okay. Okay. Doesn't laying a blade flat on a stone scratch it up? Yes, it does. We already covered that. Uh, I'm having trouble understanding how to sharpen a convex knife. Okay, well, with a convex knife, you have two options. You can grind it in such a way as to maintain the cons convexivity of the blade, or you can slowly grind a convex edge s flat, which would make it eminently more serviceable and, main and maintenance friendly. Yeah. So with a convex knife, what I recommend is even like with the cleaver that I was talking about before, if you're gonna grind, grinding flat enables you to do better maintenance over the long haul. Okay, one, one other question was, uh, somebody has a uh, Sabatier knife from uh, France, and it's older, it was made in the 50s and 60s, and some of those knives are super thick here for the first third, and then they taper down to really almost nothing in the last two thirds of the blade. So they're really thin up towards the, uh, the tip, and then back here they're fairly stout. And the question was, well, how do I go about, uh, how do I go about sharpening that as it relates to the secondary edge geometry? Well, first of all, all those knives are not straight. So uh, you wanna look and see if it's straight or not and, and do your best to fix that if you can. Uh, that's covered in blade sharpening fundamentals. The other thing too is, you know, it depends on what you want to cut and, uh, you know, basically thinner blades are going to cut better than thicker blades and sharpen a blade, see how it cuts, and then to close the circle on, on, the, uh, on, on the, the, the information and the knowledge, what you're going to do is you're going to take your two fingers and you're going to, from the spine down to the cutting edge, you're going to get a feel for the cross section of the blade just like that. And if you do that with high performing knives, that will give you a standard, a benchmark, an understanding of, of the relationship of the primary edge, the secondary edge, and the overall thickness of the blade. And so as you're sharpening, you can be constantly checking that. It's like, oh, okay, I'm still a little thick here for slicing through potatoes. Well, then you grind it some more. Again, there's no substitute for experience here, uh, but just, Go on the understanding that thinner blades always cut better than thicker blades. Okay, that was a whole lot to digest. There's a lot of overlap. A lot of it has to do with experience. Uh, but if you have stones and if you're at home scratching up your knives, then you have our wholehearted congratulations and uh, our encouragement and our, and our support. That's the way to do it. That's the way to, ac to accumulate knowledge and experience. And that's the way you go from being, an, being a beginner to an intermediate to being a master, where eventually you also will have subconscious competence. That's what you want. Okay, next time we'll talk about metals and metallurgy and blade geometry, etc. Until then, it's Murray Carter staying stay sharp.